Thank you very much indeed. Great pleasure to be here. Isn't this a wonderful building? It reminds me of a squat I used to inhabit <laughs> in 19, 1970s, and sort of holes in the ceiling and the slightly suspicious looking plumbing. Yeah, now it's, um, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And uh, thank you very much for allowing me to use slides. I'm a, I'm a statistician. I deal a lot with visualizations and images and media work and headlines, so I, I, I I'm not apologetic about using images, um, but this is, I hope this is not going to be death by PowerPoint. That's not what I, not what I do. So thank you all very much for, for coming along to a, for a detailed lecture on statistics. <laughs> so, uh, it's, uh, th so that's me. I, I'm, I, I didn't know quite what to talk about because, you know, I, got, I, was, you know, I wanted to plug the book, um, which has got a great review in yesterday's Financial Times. Oh, brilliant. Anyway, so... Um, it's, and it's doing very well. But um, uh, you know, I didn't just want to do a book plug. So I, w I wanted to talk about the thing that I, I'm absolutely uh, connected to at the moment, what me and my little team are working on, which is communicating risk and uncertainty. Because I think that might be of general interest to many people. Now, the curious thing is that although I'm a, uh, I started off as a mathematician, uh, as a statistician, then in the maths department in Cambridge, the best maths department in the world. Anyway, bizarrely, this best maths department in the world, in the cellar or in the bottom, has got this group of people who is this Winton Centre for Risk and Evidence Communication, philanthropically funded. No national proper agency would, would fund this kind of work we do. So it's from uh, um, David Harding, who's a hedge fund manager, his charitable arm. So this is a gang. There's me, but there's uh, four psychologists, uh, two ex-BBC communication people, two web designers. I w spend all the time now working with social scientists on the communication. And, um, you know, because of, well, what I'm going to, what kind of thing I'm going to be talking about. Um, because the, the, the one cannot separate out um, communication from its understanding. Communication is a two-way process. My first rule of communication is to shut up and listen. So you know your audiences and understand them. And, but I find that many people I know have a, you know, pretty well a, a rather a contempt for their audiences. They generally think that people, oh, they can't understand risk. And I don't just mean the public. I mean policymakers, ministers, and think, oh, they, they don't understand risk like we technocrats do. And the other thing is that there's, a, there's a, I think, a common belief that the world out there is intolerant of uncertainty. We may know as professionals that there's a lot of uncertainty about, but we can't admit it because the ministers won't believe us, the policymakers won't believe us, the public certainly won't believe us, they'll be distrustful. And I would like to demolish both of those myths. That's my, you know, my job at the moment is to demolish those myths because I just don't believe they're true. The reason I think that people might think this is because people have been so ill-served by the communications they receive. And I'm going to show some of those things. I think we, as the public or as anything, we receive you know, a lot of really bad messages, badly spun messages about risk and uncertainty. OK, so here's an example from two weeks ago, the killer bacon sandwich. You may remember, th this is a story that comes up regularly. This is one more paper. This is from CNN, uh, one slice of bacon a day linked to the higher risk of colorectal cancer. I mean, that's a very respectable headline. I much prefer The Sun, you know, a British tabloid newspaper that tells it as it is, a rasher of bacon a day is deadly. <laughs> ah, who had bacon this morning? Yes. <laughs> Nobody else. Who read the sun? Yeah. No, start the day with a carcinogen, I say. Come on. Yeah. Because uh, bacon is a class one carcinogen, according to WHO. It's in the same category as cigarettes. Doesn't mean it's as carcinogenic as cigarettes. It means it's got the same, um, the same level of evidence that it is carcinogenic. OK. So if we can look at this story in more detail, what does it say? This story from two weeks ago said that 25 grams of processed meat a day is associated with an 18% or 19% increased risk of bowel cancer. That was what's in the, um, you know, in the paper. And we think, well, wh what does that mean? You know, can you interpret that? What does that mean? Is that important? Do we care? Should we go, ah, I'll never touch bacon again? Or do we say, pass the brown sauce? I mean, what do we say in, re in response to that? What is our emotional... And the point is that this is the point that numbers and statistics do not speak for themselves. Nate Silver has got a lovely quote, which I use in the book, saying, we imbue them with meaning. 
And my whole talk this, uh, the, today is about the stories we tell about data, the context, the narratives, the metaphors, the imagery, is massively important to the emotional response that we get when we receive a, a, a story. And this is, you know, this is communicated in a way that's meant to frighten you. It's a well-known trick. These relative risks, the 19% increase, is, you know, tends to exaggerate the uh, impact of a story. Is where, you know, it's been resolved lots of times. And it's hugely recommended, you know, it's generally recommended in medical journals and in the media that you should not use them. Every story, when someone says, oh, this increases the risk by 19%, you say, well, 19% of what is this? Because 19% of nothing is nothing. <laughs> you know, that increase is still nothing. Well, 90% uh, of not very much is still not very much. We need to know what the baseline is. And th they didn't tell us. Nowhere in that story, in the press release, was that base. You have to go onto another site, Cancer, uh, Cancer Research UK, and find that 6% of people will get bowel cancer in their life anyway. So it's 6 out of 100. What are there, 50 people here? Three of you, sadly, will get bowel cancer during your lifetime, even if you carry on not eating bacon. Boring lot. Anyway, so... Um, <laughs> But basically, what we want to know then is what is a 19% increase over six percentage points? Now, I know of no journalist who is happy to do that calculation and communicate it on their own back. They, can, they know they should. They've been trained. They know they should. They just can't do it. They're, they're terrified. So whenever a story like this comes up, I get bombarded by emails saying, oh, how can we tell this? And I work with the Science Media Center and everything like that. The problem, and and the, the story, the way in which you should communicate this, being proven by end of psychological research, is to say, what does it mean for 100 people? It's what's known as expected frequencies or natural frequencies. OK, 100 people. 100 people like you, you know, middle-class professionals eating your granola and your compote and your blueberries every morning. I know the sort. Probably going for a run or something. Oh, dear. Anyway, sadly, you, six out of 100 of people like you will still get bowel cancer during their lifetime. Let's compare that with 100 slobs, um, you know, eating every, every other day, eating a great big greasy Brexit bacon sandwich. You know, how many will they get that? That many. You see that one extra, that's the 19% increase over the 6%. That's one extra person. That's what it is. So 100 people eating that every other day for their whole life, one extra case of bowel cancer. So that's why I had bacon this morning. But I don't eat that every day. I wouldn't eat that every day because I don't want to be the one in 100. But if I just have it every now and then, wow, poof, who cares? So th this is a way, this way to tell the stories is, you know, in terms of what does it mean for expected frequencies, expected frequencies, is, is a research-based way to communicate risk when we know the numbers, when we feel we know the numbers. Okay, so, um, and in fact, very nicely, the Sun journalist, Stuart Wooler, the Sean Wooler, the, he's, he's an excellent journalist. The story is quite good. He didn't write the headline, of course. The edit sub-editor writes the headline, he didn't write that headline. And he tweeted the next day, my explanation of this, saying what I said, how it should be explained, very generously, and which got lots of retweet. But I wasn't in time to get it into the story. Because I got, I got asked for it with only two hours to go. I was in the middle of a meeting. Ah, I can't do this anyway. So I was too late. So um, the, the nice thing is, is that this idea of expected frequencies as a way to communicate, talk about risk and probability and chance, is now in the UK GCSE math syllabus for 14 to 16 year olds. And um, we've written a whole book teaching, no, the plug, plug, sorry, book plug again, uh, teaching probability. And we've got a MOOC on, on for teaching uh, teachers how to teach probability. Um, and it, because it is shown to be such a powerful technique for, for communication. OK. Oh, plug, 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 plug. Right, OK. <laughs> now, OK. So now, th now we get on to, th that was what you might call, um, you know, all, I wouldn't say is inadvertent, but a, you know, a framing of a story that actually is, for whatever reason, is manipulative in terms of its impact. Let's look at, you know, my suspicions about a lot of science that's done is that the scientists actually do have quite an agenda. Uh, it's not a conflict of interest. It's not like they're being paid by Monsanto for glyphosate. It's not like they're being paid by the cigarette industry or things like that. People have an interest in a story, and I think we need to be very wary of that. So here's a story, because um, they, they cherry-pick evidence. OK, remember the, the insect apocalypse again about three weeks ago? Can you remember this story? Big coverage, in, no insects within a century. 
going to be die, die no incident, it's going to be awful. A lot of coverage, you know, Daily Express. The Guardian, you know, slightly more reasonable, um, said that, um, you know, blah, 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 more than 40% of insect species are declining, total mass of insects is falling by a precipitous 2.5% a year, no insects within a century. Right, do we believe that? Got huge coverage, National Geographic, everything. Do we believe that story? Do we believe it? Okay. If you've got a nasty, sceptical mind like mine, you go and check it. You go and look, and you find, you find the paper, Worldwide Decline, blah, blah, blah. This is what it's all based on. They didn't do any original research. They searched the literature for the evidence to do this claim, this statistical claim. So the crucial thing then is, if you've got this forensic statistical approach, is how did they search the literature? How did they search it? What you should do is a complete, you know, systematic review of all the relevant literature. Let's see how they did it, and it's in the paper, That's how they searched the literature. They searched for papers that mentioned insects, and mentioned surveys, and mentioned the decline. And guess what? They found a decline. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? They only looked at papers about de insect decline, so they found a decline. It's like trying to work out the average income and only asking rich people. You know, it's, it's as idiotic as that. So we've got no idea about these numbers. Our insects probably are declining, but they missed out all the papers that said they weren't or they were, they were stable. Absolutely outrageous. And, of course, they made this global generalisation and yet no papers from Africa, about one or two from Asia, they're nearly all UK and Germany. So, you know, they made it. So, all endless problems with this. And they got interviewed by more or less a wonderful programme on Radio 4, and they were completely unapologetic. They said, oh, we can't wait for the statistics to prove this. We know there's a problem. <laughs> now, there probably, there is a problem, I'm sure, about insects. People should be alert to the dangers of insects. But, actually, by using this sort of spurious science, it just opens up to every criticism that can be made by, by sceptics. It's really outrageous. So... What I'd basically say about this is that it is a matter of trust. Trust is really crucial. And, they, you know, there's a claim, there's a crisis of trust, that people don't trust experts anymore and so on. I, do, I don't believe that. The there's no evidence for that. But never mind. That's, that's you know, it is a popular uh, um, language. Now, wh I, whenever the word trust comes up, I go for Honora O'Neill. I don't know, do, do people heard of her? She's a British, yeah, she's Baroness Honora O'Neill. So she's in the House of Lords, for heaven's sakes which is a ridiculous thing, and never mind. Um, so, uh, but she's in the House of Lords, and she is brilliant. She did a TEDx Parliament, I don't like TEDx talks usually, to, but she did one for Parliament, she's just brilliant. She's a philosopher of Kant, and yet she's had enormous influence in, in, in UK sort of um, policy issues, because she talks about trust, and one of the first things she says is they've got this lovely contradictory thing, that organisations should not try to be trusted. Because every organisation I work with says, oh, we want people to trust us. EFSA said, trusted source of any data. Everyone wants to be trusted. She said, that's wrong. It's the wrong thing to do. We should not try to be trusted. What you should do is demonstrate trustworthiness. Because that is what is within our control. Trust, to be trusted, is not within our control. People have to offer it up. You have to deserve it by being trustworthy. And you think, yes, of course. But actually, it's really challenging because it means it's in our court. It's not the stupid people out there we have to deal with. We have to deal with our own trustworthiness. Okay, so she finished. This is, the this is the most important slide of the talk. Nothing to do with me. So this is the most important. Okay. She then comes up with this wonderful checklist of what we should look for when, you know, a part of being trustworthy is transparent. We want to be open and honest and transparent. And she said, well, what does that mean? Because transparency in itself is not necessarily a good thing. Just going blah and putting everything out on the internet. It's got what's called fishbowl transparency. It's hopeless. There's no use for anybody. So she says, if you're going to be transparent and open and honest, four criteria to look for. She's got on her list. It's got to be accessible. People will be able to find the information easily. It's got to be intelligible. They've got to be able to understand it. And we try to use this in all our work. It's got to be usable, it's got to suit their needs, it's got to satisfy their problems, their anxieties, their demands. So you have to listen, find out what they're concerned with. And you'd think that was enough, but this last one is an absolute cracker. Now you can take the picture. Um, accessible. You, most, most people want to take stuff on trust from experts. That's fine, I'll take it on trust. But you have to open yourself up to critique, to, to, to show you're working 
for people who want to check what you're saying. Your work has to be accessible. Amazingly powerful list that we try to, and this all ties up with the explanation and algorithms and, and AI and things like that, it's hugely tied up with this. Okay, so how do, is our communication trustworthy? Well, people who are really concerned about this, what she's had a big influence on is the code of practice for official statistics in the UK. The most recent version has got three pillars for official statistics, and the first one is trustworthiness. To be trustworthy, not to be trusted. ONS doesn't want to be trusted, it wants to be trustworthy. It would quite like to be trusted, I think. But um, it, it wants to be trustworthy, because that is within their control. So she's had this extraordinary influence. So I always ask, is it trustworthy? You know, are we being trustworthy? Okay, so part of demonstrating trustworthiness is admitting uncertainty. It's having the humility to admit we don't know. And people aren't very good at that. Okay, let me look at an example. Um, two trusted institutions, the BBC and the Office for National Statistics, reporting on unemployment, saying, here we are, the BBC saying, unemployment fell by 3,000 um, in this quarter. Okay, so, you know, BBC, ONS, what could be better than that? Well, do we believe that number? Do we believe it? Well, should we believe it? Is it a trustworthy number? We should go back to the website, we check that, we finally find something that says about quality and methodology, and we check that, and we, we search, we search, and we search, and we finally find a paragraph that says the 95% confidence interval around this 3,000 is plus or minus 77,000. They've got no idea whether unemployment went up or down. They know it didn't change that much. Absolutely no idea whether it went up or down. And yet the BBC confidently say it went down. People writing whole articles explaining why it's gone down again. They're completely spurious because there was no acknowledgement of the uncertainty in that figure unless you really searched for it. And this is not very good. Now, some institutions are better. Now, my favourite is the Bank of England who Mervyn King introduced these fan charts um, to show uncertainty about the future in the main thing. These fans show 30%, 60%, and 90% prediction intervals for the future for the monetary, assessed by the monetary policy committees. Outside the 90%, the bets are off. Could be anywhere outside that. 10% chance that it's somewhere else. No, no saying where it might be. But you can see that they've got a lot of uncertainty about the future. They're pretty uncertain about what's going on at the moment, and they haven't got much of a clue what went on in the past either. <laughs> so they're very honest, because GDP gets revised all the time. Recessions come and go in, in, in the history. So they're really honest about their uncertainty about that. Now, can we do better? Can we do better? So can we communicate this kind of uncertainty without losing trust and credibility? That's the thing. We've had grants now just to explore this. Can officials do this? So we're working, we've done some randomised trials. We're doing work with the psychologists. Well, let's do some experiments, online experiments. Ask people about, and we're, we're talking about things like the, the number of unemployed, the number of tigers in India, global temperature change, none of which we know. All of which we've got uncertainty about. We don't know any of these things. So, and we communicate either as a single number, as a range, or a verbal qualifier. You know, we're uncertain about this number, just a verbal qualifier. And what we find when you're asking a thousand people online about all this stuff, um, and I'll, I'll just, you yeah, know, this is very, I'll say what this shows because it's quite difficult to read. Basically, it shows that um, to what extent do you think this number is uncertain, um, yet people recognize that a range is more uncertain than the number, and a verbal qualifier is even more uncertain. So it communicates the uncertainty of the number. To what extent do you think this number is reliable? Yeah, reliability goes down as the uncertainty goes up. But the final one is what we're really interested in. What do you th how does it change your trust in the source of the data by admitting that uncertainty? And the crucial thing with this is that if you give a verbal qualifier, the trust goes down a bit. But if you give the range, it doesn't change at all. In fact, it went up a little bit, but um, not, not of any significance. So, and we've re done this experiment four times in different contexts, and every time we find that if you are confident about your uncertainty, by giving, by giving a range, and I want a point estimate and a range, and think, no reduction in trust whatsoever, by being a, by, even if it's quite wide. So that confident expression of uncertainty does not reduce trust, which is, I think, a really exciting finding.
So we're now working with migration, you know, an uncontested subject, migration into the UK. I mean, who would worry about that? I mean, <laughs> who cares about that at all? So we thought we'd tackle that um, because they're highly uncertain, the statistics. They're based on a survey, it's not very good, not that great at all. And um, this is how they've been communicated in the past, as point estimates showing trends in overall migration. So um, uh, net migration is this black one, is, is that one. Uh, the top one is, my, is immigration, the orange one is, is, is emigration. So um, point estimates given, and there's, there's some margins of error, but they're hidden. But we've been working with them now, and the public way in which this is communicated now is with some blurring, what we call fuzzy fans. They're like fan charts, but we fuzz them a bit. Apparently, and, and we've done randomized trials now testing this format with different audiences. They can understand it. It's a little bit more difficult. Doesn't reduce trust in the, in the source. Um, we've tested this with, um, yeah, but with people, users of the migration statistics, which involved our psychologists not only phoning up migration observatory at, at Oxford University, but Migration Watch, the right-wing, you know, um, anti-migration uh, organization. So we phone them up and say, is this helpful to you? you know, do, how, what do you understand by these statistics? So we interview any users, we want to find out whether it's, this is useful. Now, the problem is that this is only one source of uncertainty. It's only the sort of survey error that we can put numbers on. And people have said, well, look, you know, you're deluding people if you think the uncertainty is much bigger than that because it's not a very good survey and so on. There are sort of systematic problems. And that's, of course, our new real challenge is how do you communicate systematic problems with data, which you can't necessarily put numbers on. So that's what we're working when you've got doubts about the underlying science or models. How do you communicate that? We can, if we can do ranges, that's fine. There's clearly no problem at all with that. And we've just got a paper that's coming out tomorrow on communicating uncertainty about facts, numbers, and science in the Royal Society of Open Science, which is a review of what everybody has suggested and tested for communicating this kind of uncertainty. And I think it's really cool, a great big thing. Um, but it, it, I think it could be helpful. I hope it's helpful. Um, one of the things we, we do emphasize is the difference between direct expressions of uncertainty, which may be uh, a range or a distribution or even a words, and what we call indirect, when we actually can't quantify or even express how big this uncertainty might be directly. We just have to say, well, the evidence isn't very good. We just have to say, give caveats. The quality of the underlying evidence. And I'm sure all of you who do any handling of evidence know, of course, that some is better than others. Some you can trust their claims much more than others. And that's not, all, not always something you can just put an interval on, which is only to do with sample sizes, to do with much more than that. So we're getting to the, to what for a statistician I find really tricky, which is stuff we can't put numbers on. I hate it, but we've got to do it. And the point is that everyone is faced with this problem now in policy making of how do we express our confidence in our analysis. UK work centres are really taking this on board. Um, uh, Education Endowment Foundation is reviewing all the educational interventions that people might want to try. And uh, they're doing star ratings. This is like TripAdvisor. This is the TripAdvisor of policy, in which you give star ratings. The pound one says how much, how expensive the hotel is. No, you know, how expensive the intervention is. The number at the end is how many months they would estimate it would put on to a child's development on average. So it's the overall benefit. But the interesting one to me is the padlocks, which says how good is the underlying science? Have we got good randomized trials, or is this just a bit of opinion? And, and that's the, that seems to be really valuable. So behavior interventions is really good. Well, I know, what's, what's a good one? Oh, yeah, collaborative learning is cheap, effective, good evidence. Fantastic. Do it. Whereas, what have we got here? Um, aspiration interventions <laughs> is expensive, it doesn't work, and the evidence is crap anyway. So, <laughs> so maybe we don't do that one. Um, so they... This is a, a t you know, short takeaway messages, and everyone's doing this. In, in health, I won't go into this in detail, but um, for uh, po policies for different medical treatments, um, the outcomes are graded according to what's called the grade scale, the quality of evidence. Is this four-star evidence? Is it high? Is it three-star? Often it's only two-star or one-star evidence. You know, in other words, is this just based on a case series, or is there a randomized trial, and so on. Everyone's doing this. Um, IPCC do it. 
uh, for climate change. They, some things they're happy to put numbers on, other things they just say, we've got low confidence in the science, we're not going to put any numbers on it. So they assess, again, the confidence in the science. So IPCC are doing this. Everyone's coming to the conclusion that we don't just need these numerical summaries, we also need an expression of you know, how believable our claims are. Okay, so tr to finish then, trustworthy communication, intelligent openness, blah, 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 accessible, intelligible, usable, accessible, all say after me, intelligible, <laughs> you should march home singing that in, in behind a banner. Okay, um, I think be confident about uncertainty. Well, I'm uncertain. What are you going to do about it? Um, listen to and respect audiences, multiple layered formats, I could talk about that in detail, about the actual ways in which you might do things. Test outputs, of course, vigorously preempt misunderstandings just if people got it wrong. But I would just like to finish off, and I really am finishing off, I work closely with the communication professionals. I just have to admit that communication doesn't always work, and I'd like to just point out um, a pr some problems I have had personally. Um, sometimes communication goes wrong. Um, I wrote a book, my previous book was Sex by Numbers, um, which didn't sell as well as this one, sadly, but it's a very good book. Um, it's all about sex statistics, and that was the cover. That was going to be the cover that they, 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 the designer came up with. Yeah, and, um, and I thought this was great. And then W.H. Smith, the big bookseller, said, oh, no, 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 we can't have that on our shelves. So this was the banned cover. Um, so, and I went around talking about this, and one of the things that people were, the press is always interested in is how often do people have sex? So this is what, for me, seemed very young couples, 16 to 44, based on the big, really very good British surveys of sexual behaviour, reporting in 1990 that these couples reported, I mean they had, but reported having sex, on average, you know, the median was five times a month. In 2000, it was four times a month. By 2010, it was three times a month. So I think if we can carry on that extrapolation, this is very worrying for the future of the British race. And this sort of decline has been shown in America and other European countries as well. So everyone says, why? And, of course, everyone blames the iPad, the phone, the connectivity, the emails. I'm just checking the emails. And, but when, when I was talking about this at a, at a festival, I said, oh, well, I blame the box set. Can't come to bed, dear. I'm binge-watching Game of Thrones. So um, th 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 whether that's true or not, that was my speculation. Anyway, so I said all this in a talk, and there was a journalist writing it all down in the front row. I thought, great, I'm going to get some really good coverage. I was really pleased, you know, and all that. And then the next day, Britons are having less sex, <laughs> and Game of Thrones could be to blame, warns Cambridge professor. <laughs> God! In the Daily Telegraph. Oh, no! And then I read the article, it got worse. It says, these trends, David Spiegelhalter, blah, 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 these trends were very worrying, and if it current trends continue, couples will not be having sex at all by 2030. <laughs> And I was like, oh my God, I did say that. I did, I did. It was a joke, but I did say it. She was right. She wrote it. I said that. She wrote it down in went the article. I thought, oh no, this is awful. Anyway, I thought, oh, well, who cares? Tomorrow's chip wrapper. What I didn't realise is how the modern media works. Once one journalist says this, everyone can copy it. So Newsweek, <laughs> is Game of Thrones ruining our sex lives? Couples will stop having sex by 2030. So that, and this is my favourite, this is my favourite. Sex will be obsolete by 2030 because of Netflix, according to one lone scientist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you think, you know, I've spent 40 years building up this reputation. <laughs> and it goes on. You go to German, of course, you know, opportunity to have a half naked woman and an Italian, what Professor Spiegelhalter says. And it doesn't stop. This is just from a few weeks ago in French. We're not going to have you know, love in, in 2030. Um, and then, again, just a few weeks ago, a tweet in Spanish about this, what David Spiegelder says, there's going to be no sex. But, oh, no. This is my favourite, the, the tweet in, fr in French that says, um, enjoy it while there's still time, he said. <laughs> I said, I don't think I did. And that's from three weeks ago. This just comes up again and again. People keep on saying, can you ask wanting to interview me? Oh, God. My faith, though, in the media was restored by one journalist who wrote, Is Game of Thrones Killing Your Sex Life? But then went on to try to answer the question by looking at the data. And he plotted the data. He's a data journalist. He plots the data, the five, the four, the three, does the stupid trend back you know, forwards. But he had the genius to realize that if you can extrapolate forwards, you can extrapolate backwards and estimate 
that in the year zero, <laughs> people were having sex 200 times a month, which I think explains quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think it just goes to show that statistics can prove anything at all. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.